thank New York Assemblywoman Donna Laporto and City Council Member Dan Livingston for making an appearance. Father Fred Brooks is going to come up, he's going to do our benediction, and then we will get into doing the musical acts. I've written some words uh, about this day. I'd, I'd like to make a few comments before we move into uh, the, uh, our prayer. We are deeply indebted to the planning committee for this event. We highlight by this event the importance of workers' safety and health. We also honor the memory of those persons who have been injured or killed in the workplace. We uh, realize anew how close we are again to human pain and loss and are reminded again that we are bound together as brothers and sisters. In this workplace memorial observance, in this place made holy by God and by our holy concerns for the injured and the dead, we express our sorrow and commit anew to the safety of those who work in dangerous places. No one of us is unaffected by a work-related incident that has transformed life in a devastating, painful way for families and loved ones. In the past, I mentioned my father was burned in a tractor accident on a farm, and that devastated our family. Many of us recognize the spiritual overtones of the workers' memorial observances. Each person we, some of us believe, is created by, with God-given dignity. Each person is precious in God's sight. When there's injury and unexpected death to even one human being, the pain reaches far beyond the workplace, to the circles of family and friends, to the wider community. In this hour and place made sacred by God and those of us who care deeply about the injured and the dead, we demonstrate compassion for those in need. We advocate for the safety of our sisters and brothers in the places of employment. In this moment, let us acknowledge God's presence and direct our words to the Holy One. I have written this prayer, but I hope these words are not only mine, but they become yours as we speak to our God. God of infinite power and unlimited grace, in these quiet moments, our thoughts and hopes reach beyond our mundane concerns. In your presence, our hearts are filled with gratitude. Our minds are filled with memories. We offer our thanks for life and family, for community and nation, for the beauty of your creation. Gracious God, you have formed the world and its people and challenged each of us to be creative in our human relationships and in our contact with all of creation. As we use our heads, our hearts, and our hands to forge our modern society, we are especially aware of our vulnerability, the fragility of our existence, and the tensions and conflicts evident among peoples and nations. We gather this afternoon, O oh God, to acknowledge that we identify with those injured in their workplaces we mourn with the families of those killed while working. But gracious God, we know that our mourning is hollow unless we demonstrate a personal concern for our friends and co-workers. Awaken and renew our passion for justice for those who come in contact with dangerous chemicals and fast moving machines and endure long hours of labor Increase our compassion for all who labor. Grant us wisdom and energy as we work for their health and safety. 
in this time of trial for all who labor refresh and renew with your healing grace inspire us to live and work with great purpose and enriching hope amid the confusing and uncaring voices of our day we appeal for strength to endure empower us to move our communities and our nation to a better place may we work with you O god to heal your world and to enrich the lives of all amen amen, amen. amen. without any further ado i'd like to introduce magpie and george mann Greg Arsner and Terry Leonino from Magpie. Mm -hmm. We were here last year, so we're honored to be back singing with you again to honor Workers on Workers Memorial Day. And uh, to think about, want to sing songs today about the struggle and sacrifice of workers throughout history, but particularly connected to the labor movement, which we know is the, the best vehicle for workers to ensure fairness, safety, and job conditions and decent standard of living on a job. Um, I had turned the master up for Father Fred, right? I don't know if you know. Yeah. So we're going to start with a song called We Just Come to Work Here, We Don't Come to Die. A song written by a great man named Harry Stamper, longshore worker out in Oregon who passed away only two years after he retired, after some 30 years of working out as a longshoreman. But he was a folk singer too, and he wrote some really great labor songs. And this is one of them. We Just Come to Work Here, We Don't Come to Die. Oh, 
and music. Um, this is one of the parodies that he wrote while he was on death row and, uh, in uh, 19, probably in the summer of 1915. Um, he had a friend out in San Francisco write him a letter in jail and saying, you know, Joe, you ought to work up some words for this song that's on everybody's lips these days. Um, it's called, It's a Long Way to Tipperary. And Joe wrote him back and said, well, you know, I'd like to do that for you, but, you know, I haven't heard the song. He'd been in jail for months and months. Uh, but if you send it to me, I'd be happy to do that. So the guy sent him the music, and uh, this is what Joe wrote. It's become a kind of a famous song. And, and like, so please sing along. It's a long way to the soup line. It's a long way down to the soup line. When work was hard to find The landlord put him on the stem The bankers kept his dome And Bill heard everybody sing No matter where he goes It's a long way down to the soup line It's a long way to go It's a long way down to the soup line And the soup is Stay. 
experience of a mutual friend of ours, a fellow by the name of Rudy Aritando. Rudy was an early member of the uh, United Farm Workers. In fact, he was recruited into the organization by Cesar Chavez himself, and he marched shoulder to shoulder with Cesar. Uh, Rudy grew up working in the fields, and, uh, and in his adulthood, sometime in his late 30s, uh, he started to experience the ravages of working in the fields, being exposed to the pesticides, uh, both from the ground and from the air. And uh, fortunately, he was able to overcome those troubles uh, through various different means, including acupuncture. Um, but uh, this was, uh, this song is pretty much Rudy's experience and also the experience of countless thousands of workers in this country who travel all over the country from east to west. You know, all the farm workers aren't just in California. A lot of them have come here to New York State. So we dedicate this to all of the farm workers that are out there now and who are experiencing similar things because, you know, we don't have the controls that we used to have over a lot of these things. But hopefully it's going to get better. So this is called Something in the Rain. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, it's your boss, or it's, you know, uh, well, Agent I know Orange. Who I, I know I Agent Orange. <laughs> Think about it. Oh, that guy. So, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is Woody's take on it. You know that uh, when Woody Guthrie lived in Coney Island, his, uh, his landlord was a guy named Fred Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> father of. And father of. Donald Trump. I don't know who he was thinking about when he wrote this song, though. I don't this know. This is a talking blues called Mean Talking Blues. Get, get, get ready, because this is pretty mean. It's really mean. Scatters, aches, and pains. I'm carbolic acid and a poison face, and I stand flat footed in favor of crime and disgrace. If ever done a good deed, I'm sorry of it. Just like you or anybody else. 
then I just turned off me. and to see it work and I'm reading all the books I can to learn how to hurt give you misery spread the diseases keep you without no vote keep you without no union oh I hurt want to see you get along so well and ten times rather see you in the fires of hell can't stand to see you all fixed up in that house of nice. I'd rather keep you down in that rotten hole with the bugs and the lice. And the roaches. And the termites. And the sand fleas and the grub worms and the tater bugs and the stingarees and the venerones and the tarantulas and the spiders and the ticks and the blowflies. These is all my little angels going around doing the best parts of my meanness. And mosquitoes. Well, I used to be a fairly nice feller till I turned a scab and then I turned off yeller. I fought every union tooth and toenail and then I sprouted a six inch stinger right in the middle of my tail. And I rode horns and I cut them off. I wanted to fool ya. I hated union everywhere, cause God likes unions, and I hate God. Now if I get the fat to hate the lean, that'll tickle me more than anything I've seen. Then get the coloreds to fight one another, and friend against friend, and brother and sister against brother, that'll be just fit. Everybody's brains boiling in turpentine And their teeth falling out all up and down the street That'll just suit me fine Cause I hate everything that's union And I hate everything that's organized And I hate everything that's planned And I love to hate And I hate to love Terry and I, we love to sing the old songs. A lot of the songs we sing are old, very old. Uh, some of the great labor songs that came from the early parts of last century. Good night. And uh, this is another one from the IWW. It was written by an unknown proletarian. It was uh, shown up in the Little Red song, the IWW song, with the 1919 edition. And it's called, We Have Fed You All a Thousand Years. And uh, to me, it's one of the great, great uh, unknown labor songs because it talks about our sacrifice, and especially on a day like today when we, we think about those who lost their job, their lives on the job. Uh, this song talks about that sacrifice a hundred years ago. Remember, we didn't have the right to organize unions. We didn't have OSHA. We didn't have overtime laws. It's the sacrifice of many of our ancestors that, that brought those things to us. It's called, We Fed You All a Thousand Years. One, two, three. Dead by the 
the porch is red and the factories where we spin but it will be the price of your full wealth for God we have paid it in we have fed you all for a thousand years but that was our doom you know what a day Right a week ago You've taken our lives and our babies and wives We're told it's your legal share But it must be the price of your lawful wealth For God we have bought it fair Yes, it must be the price of your lawful wealth Good God we have bought it fair one from Utah Phillips. Utah Phillips, it's 10, 11 years now since he passed away. One of our great folk singers in law, uh, one of the people who really preserved the stories of the, the workers and the unions from 100 years ago. He came out of uh, serving at the end of the Korean War, and he rode the rails for a couple of years as a bum, as a homeless bum, just dr you know, drunk, upset with what he had seen over in Korea when he was serving. And, uh, Oh, he finally, he ended up in Salt Lake City and spent about seven or eight years working there at the Joe Hill House, uh, which was a Catholic worker house uh, for the poor, for the indigent, you know, for the traveling workers, itinerant workers, hobos, as we call them. Remember, a hobo is not a bum. There is a difference. A hobo works and wanders. A tramp dreams and wanders. Whereas a bum just drinks and wanders. And hobos built the railroads. They built the roads. They built the, dug the mines, right? Uh, they helped build the dams that brought electric and water to the West Coast. Well, Utah wrote some great, great songs, and he finally started singing in late 1968, 69, and came east. And by then, people had been hearing about his songs for a long time. And he wrote songs such songs as The Green Rolling Hills of West Virginia, um, and uh, songs that other people uh, all used up as the harm of singing, a great song of his. About an old worker thinking he's all used up and thinking that he still has something to give, right? Good. You talk for us. Well, I spent my whole life making somebody rich. I busted my ass for that son of a bitch. And he left me to die like a dog in a ditch. And he told me I'm all used up. He used up my labor, he used up my time. He plundered my body and he squandered my mind. Then gave me a pension of hand house and wine. Told me I'm all used up. My kids are in hot, to a got your cold work. Slaving their lives out for some of the jerk. Yeah, my youngest in Frisco just made shipping clerk. And he don't know I'm all used up. The young people reaching for power and gold. Have respect for anything old, for pennies that bought it for promises sold. One day they'll all be used up. Yeah, they use up the oil, they use up the trees, they use up the air, and they use up the sea. Well, how about you, friend, and how about me? What's left when we're all used up? I'll finish this lock in this crummy hotel. It's lousy with bugs and my god, what a smell. But my plumbing still works and I'm clear as a bell. Don't tell me I'm all used up. And outside my window the world rushes by. Gives me a hand out and spits in my eye. And no one can tell me cause no one knows why. I'm living, but I'm all used up. Sometimes in my dreams I sit by a tree. My life is a book of how things used to be. And the kids gather around and listen to me. And they don't think I'm all used up. And there's songs and there's laughter and things I can do. And all I've learned I can give back to you. And I'd give my last breath just to make it come true. And no, I'm not all used up. They up the oil, they use up the trees, they use up the air, and they use up the sea. Well, how about you, friend, and how about me? What's left when we're all used up? Well, thank you. We're going to do one to close out this first bracket, this first set. And, uh, and Michael will be back, of course, to uh, 
speak a little more about the workers this year that we're honoring. Now, this song was written by uh, Ronnie Gilbert of the Weavers. Um, for those of you that remember Pete Seeger's uh, group before he became famous, he was with a group called the Weavers. And Ronnie uh, was quite the writer. She was also quite the actor. She did a one-woman show of Mother Jones, three hours. Um, soliloquy of some of her speeches, some of the things she said, and uh, and then interspersed with some very beautiful music. And Greg and I heard this song from that Mother Jones show and just fell in love with it. And we talked to her about it and we, we told her we thought it was one of the best uh, union songs we ever heard. It's called Build High the Bridge. Thank you. 
you very much. I'd like to welcome Mike back up for the next. Thank everybody for coming today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mike Dunnan. I'm the president of the Broom Tioga Labor Council. I'm also president of Labor's Local 785. This is the vice president of the Broom Tioga Labor Council, Phil Shanahan. So I want to read a statistic to you. In 2017, nearly 5,200 workers were killed on the job and millions more were injured. But that is only part of the deadly toll. Each year, 95,000 workers die from occupational diseases caused by toxic chemical exposures and other health hazards. So here we are in the 21st century and still thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of workers every year are still dying and they're still being injured on a job site. OSHA's, OSHA helps and OSHA regulations are great, but there is only the smallest number of OSHA inspectors since 1970 at this time. So for us to prevent injured workers or workers being killed on a job site, at their job, their factory, their hospital, we have to unite together. Workers have to fight for workers. They have to stand up for the rights of other workers and not allow um, workers to be exploited, workers to be put in dangerous situations, or workers to get killed and then be brushed under the rug. A lot of employers, when workers get hurt or killed, they try to do everything they can to avoid workers' compensation, which is just unheard of. It's crazy that this still happens in the 21st century. So with that being said, I'm hoping that everybody, as they're hearing the music, make sure everybody has enough to eat. But keep in mind, look out for your fellow workers, stand up for fellow workers, because one person uh, being loud and making noise isn't always heard, but a group of people will always be heard. So without um, any more hearing from me, Phil's going to read off the, name, uh, the names of workers that were killed in our area this past year. Thank you, Mike. Like I said, my name is Phil Shanahan, and I am reading out eight people's names who died in um, 2018 and so far this year in 2019 that will not be coming home to their families and, you know, just died on the job and, you know, just just in memory of these eight people in the general area, the southern tier. Dennis Matthew Howe, Daniel Prince Drew, Asim Musa, Christopher Hicks, Stephen Gutnicht, Teddy Florzik, Michael Harding, and Eugene Wolford. Those were all workers that went to work that morning expecting to come home safe and sound and they never made it home just trying to provide for their families. So without um, any other intercession, if anybody else doesn't need anything, we'll get back into the music. Thank you very much. Thank you. A lot of people uh, tend to uh, forget that. This song helps everybody remember it and you can help us sing it. It's called Union Made. Everybody knows the chorus to this song. I hope. You can't scare me, I'm sticking to the union. Sticking to the union until the day I die. Take a little tip from me. 
Raise your hand and take a stand and join the fight for liberty. Mother Jones showed the way. The strike for higher pay. She had to fight to win that right, and this is what she'd say. Oh, you can't scare me. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. I'm sticking to the union. song to honor Pete Seeger. Um, uh, just a few days, May 3rd, to be the uh, 100th anniversary of Pete Seeger's uh, birth. He was born May 3rd, 1919, and he passed away uh, about just over five years ago in January 2014. Mm. And not just a mentor and a friend to us, uh, especially these folks who knew him much longer than I did, but for everyone in the folk music world, he was an example of integrity, of history and of course of great songs and musicianship. Now this is a song he didn't write, but he sang in most of his concerts right until the end of his life. A song called How Can I Keep From Singing? And that's your line. I see some heads nodding, so I expect to hear you singing there. Rick? <laughs> well, we'll all blend together. How can I keep from singing? And it's based on an old Shaker hymn. The first two verses go back to, I don't know, the 1700s roughly. But then the third verse is written by a woman named Doris Plen during the, the McCarthy era in the 1950s. That's the third verse. Uh, but please join us when you get to that line, how can I keep from singing? Because when in times of trouble, in times of sadness, in times of loss, music, of course, is, is what makes the heart whole again and, and makes us feel together. It goes like this. My life flows on in endless song Above us lamentation I hear the reel of far off him That hails a new creation Through all the tumult and the strife I hear that music ringing it sounds an echo in my soul. How can I keep from singing? But though the tempest loudly roars, I know the truth it liveth. But though the darkness round me glows, Songs in the night it given No storm can shake my inmost calm While to that rock I'm clinging Since long is low of heaven and earth How can I keep from singing?
Well, I'm making a mention, uh, especially for the audience, and uh, many of you know this, I would think, but a lot of you probably don't know that Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie were great, great friends, right? Pete was six years younger than Woody. And when uh, Pete would met Woody, Woody who was you know 27 years old, had been bumming around for six, seven years at that point, had sung all over California in the farms for the workers, and had come to New York at the invitation of Will Gear, uh, the great actor who had seen him in California. He said, Woody, come to New York. We want you to, you know, we want people to hear your music. And that's where Pete met him. And uh, and one of the many debts that that society owes Pete Seeger is the fact that Pete Seeger is the one who brought this land, this your land, out to the masses, really. Woody wrote that song way back in 1941 when he was hitchhiking, uh, hitchhiking over across the United States, and he recorded it, but it never went anywhere. It was never a, a hit record when Woody was recording albums in the 40s, and Woody was not that big of a star himself. Um, and then he got a uh, Huntington's disease, which is similar to Parkinson's disease. And it was Pete Seeger in the late 50s who started singing this land to shoreland. And remember this song that Woody had from 15 years ago that virtually no one had heard. And he, he brought it to the kids in the colleges and the camps, and overnight it became like, like wildfire. It spread through the folk movement and inspired people like Bob Dylan and, and of course, Judy Collins and Joan Baez. Even the Kingston Trio sang this land to show land. I remember hearing that on one of their records as a kid, you know? So, uh, so we should remember that. Um, and Woody and Pete were very close right to the end, you know? Even though Woody was in the hospital most of the last years of his life. So I wrote this song about Woody Guthrie some 20 years ago when I had written a bio, uh, read, read the biography about Woody that Joe Klein wrote. One of the best books about Woody Guthrie called Woody Guthrie Alive. It's called Oklahoma's Son. And uh, it's my way of remembering Woody Guthrie. by an Oklahoma sun That could be the biggest thing a man has ever done Oh Woody, you were past it by the time that I was born And your Huntington's disease and left you frail and mute and tall Already bound for glory, a million thoughts, a thousand songs. Already passed to legend by the day that I was born. You were Oklahoma's son, but in the end belonged to no one. Sign painter, singer, sailor, soldier, born. Father and a child, a fascist fighting union man. Writing songs and poems for everyone. Though the dust bowl couldn't stop you, up with the bulls in the railroad yards. You found thousands of your people on the bridges and in boxcars. There was Opportunity in everything you saw. Chance to turn a witnessing into another song. Yeah, you were Oklahoma's son, but in the end belonged to no one. Sign painter, singer, sailor, soldier, born. Both a father and a child. Fascist fighting union man. You were writing songs and poems for everyone. Sure, in later years you staggered drunk, disabled, rambling on. There's so much in your short life and work to cherish and pass on. Though they don't sing all your words in polite company, still 
Girl, I know this land was truly made for you and me. So every time I sing that song to the old or to the young, yeah, I sing all the verses like I know you would have done. And I bow my head to greatness, make sure they know who you were. This gift I got from Oklahoma Sun. That could be the greatest gift from Oklahoma Sun. That could be the biggest thing a man has ever done. setting up but I wanted to share this song with you today because it's a song I, I learned from a young Australian songwriter I do tour Australia each year and I've been going over there for years uh, eight years now in a row I'll be going back there in October and uh, I often do concerts for labor courses in Melbourne uh, Tasmania Sydney uh, all the way up in Brisbane and Newcastle and, and when I was down in uh, Melbourne about four or five years ago, I met this old miner, a good union guy, and uh, his name is uh, Bob Mancour, and he's a great folk singer himself, but he was a union miner and active for many, many years, and he gave me an album that his son recorded, and he said, you know, my son tried to make it in the music business, but he, he gave it up after a few albums and five or six years, and he had kids to raise and got a real job, you know? And I heard this one song on that record that, that really moved me. And then when I went back a couple years later and Bob was gonna be at a concert I was singing at to honor Joe Hill in 2015, I, uh, I sang this song with Bob in the audience and watched him cry, you know, as, as I sang his son's song. Uh, Cause I didn't tell him I was gonna sing this song, you know. It's a song about a miner down in Mexico working just on the edge of the border for cash, you know. Uh, it's his story. And uh, it's called 70 Miles from the Border. job in mind Got his foot in the door But he fell down the hole It's gas in an open flame About
gonna take us to town Now he's 70 miles from the border And he's three miles on the ground So Maria but a few hours left of oxygen I wish I'd left you more Than this hole I find myself in Love children As I always have loved you Take you to town. Now I'm 70 miles from the border and three miles on the ground. 70 miles from the border and three miles on the ground. important women in the labor movement was a, a young Irish girl by the name of Elizabeth Gurley Freeman. And she would soapbox and, and organize like nobody. And of course was very responsible for saving a lot of the children uh, in the Lawrence strike by putting them all on trains and sending them places where they would be safe. So um, this is a tribute to all the women union workers and uh, it's called Rebel Girl written by Joe Hill. So this is one of those Joe Hill songs that's words and music for the Joe Hill. Yes. And, uh, so sing along. This is sort of the, this is actually the original melody and the original harmony of the song. A lot of people have done this song over the years and they've changed it, you know, they've done, done different arrangements. Hazel Dickens did a bluegrass version of it and our friend Joe Glazer used to sing it. It's kind of slow, like a Gregorian chant. And, and our friend John McCutcheon took Joe Hill's original melody and threw it right out the window and made it into a like a contemporary singer songwriters version but we went back to the original sheet music which was published by the industrial workers of the world back in 19 whatever 17 or so and uh we found out wow joe hill actually wrote a ragtime march and that's what it is Thank you. 
Opportunity to go out to um, Terre Haute, Indiana, and visit Eugene V. Debs Museum, which is in fact the home of Eugene V. Debs, the house that he and his wife built uh, during all those years when he was traveling the country and helping to organize unions and standing up for socialism. Imagine that. And running for president, too. He ran for president five times, did Eugene B. Debs. Last time he ran for president, he was in prison down in Atlanta, in the Atlanta Penitentiary, and he, he garnered damn near a million votes while he was in prison. He was a really amazing, amazing man. And um, so after touring the museum, we had a, we had a personal tour with a woman who was uh, on the board of the Eugene B. Debs Foundation, and uh, I just had a great time. We got all inspired. And uh, we were on our way from Terre Haute down to D.C. and we stopped in Columbus and uh, spent the night. And the next morning I got up and I was just determined. I went and I looked up the Canton speech, the famous, or some would say infamous speech that Eugene V. Debs gave in my hometown of Canton, Ohio in June of 1918, the, the speech that landed him in prison under the Espionage Act. And I was actually able to get the speech and I got a printout of it. I think it was about 20 pages long. And then while Terry drove, I read the thing aloud. It took an hour and a half just to read the speech. And of course, that was not being punctuated by applause from the audience. And the other thing that's really remarkable about the speech is this dead style of oratory was entirely impromptu and improvisational. He was a completely natural speaker. And in those days, of course, there were no microphones. You know, this room would be nothing to talk into. But he was standing up in front of crowds of thousands of people in the open air and reaching every person to the back of the room, back of the crowd. In the case of the Canton speech, there were about a thousand people in the audience. And it was in Nimisola Park, which is right near my home, a place I spent a fair amount of my childhood. And uh, he delivered this speech to a thousand people with no PA system. And it's such an incredible speech. You really look it up. It's just 
uh, the things that he said are so prescient, particularly with what's going on right now in our current political situation. Um, so, well, we wrote this song based on that experience, but from the point of view of some kid, not that young, he'd have to be in his 20s because he actually voted for Debs the last time. Young guy, but he's never seen uh, Debs before, never heard him in person, but just heard about him. Now here he is in front of him in Canton, Ohio, on the stage at this little gazebo in this park here. He's come to my hometown, and here he is speaking. And that's the gist of the song. We call it Canton 1918. Back in 1918, on a sunny day in June, a thousand of us gathered that hopeful afternoon. Hidden in a cell apart between the railroad and the creek To see Eugene Victor Debson To hear him speak He came down to Canton To talk and take a stand For peace and justice for the working class throughout the land Now forever I'll remember Coming here with a cry against the war When so many in our country were still itching for that fight He was a solitary beacon in a stormy night He'd come to see our comrades in the workhouse locked away They would not feed the war machine their consciences betray From the Yunkers to the robber barons money what it's for, poor workers were daily dying in a rich man's war. He said there are better days ahead, if to ourselves we're true, and we'll all rise in common cause, rebuild this world anew. If we just work together, stand for what is right, make this great cause triumphant all the working class. From a heart so true and wise With courage unrelenting His words defy their power Even though no doubt he knew the danger of the hour He said a thousand times I'd rather be A free soul in jail Than a coward in the streets A sycophant for sale And so I stood in thrall there that summer day that man changed my life with every word he had to say he said there are better days ahead if to ourselves we're true and we'll all rise in common cause rebuild this world anew if we just work together stand for what is right make this great cause triumphant all the working Jail. Sedition, so they say. A dangerous man like Dennis just has to be stopped dead. He said, I ask no mercy, plead for no immunity. For now I see the rising of those who would be free. I clearly see the struggle now between our human need and the wicked powers of exploitation of greed. 
But the cross of stars is bending as we pass through the night. And the people awaken joyful in the hope of morning light. He said there are better days ahead if to ourselves we're true. And we'll all rise and come and cause and rebuild this world anew. If we just work together, stand for what is right, make this great cause triumphant. We sang it in a hotel room for a friend of ours once. Um, but um, we really wanted to do it today because it, it speaks to, I think, the, I, the ideal world that we're kind of all striving for. And that's one of the reasons that we, that we have unions in the first place. Huh? So this is another PsyCon song. Now, PsyCon is turning 75 this year. Some of you in the labor movement know about PsyCon. He has spent most of his life uh, organizing, and he always writes the, some of the best songs. So we're going to do a couple of his songs tonight, and this one, when we just rediscovered it, you know, when, when somebody's so prolific, you look through their work and you go, oh my God, how did I forget that one? So here's one of those ones that we forgot and uh, re-found recently, and uh, it's called... And they all sang bread and earth. Our witness 
Our presence here is witness to the power of the past. And just as we have drawn our strength from those who now are gone, younger hands will take our work and carry on. And they'll all sing bread and roses, Joe Hill and Union May. They'll link their arms and tell each other, we are not afraid. Solidarity for wanted to come up and say a few more words and open the floor for any other topics that people want to address today before we do one last set. As Mike's making his way up, I might mention Mag might have a wonderful new album called When We Stand Together that has a lot of the songs they're singing tonight. Uh, and I released a new album called One at a Time since I was here last year with you all. Um, if you get a chance and you're interested, please check out the CDs and the dozens of CDs that we've made over our careers. Um, but Mike, I know you want to say a few more words and then open the floor up and i will do one more. Uh, and these are the Thank employers you. across America that end up causing the most uh, workers hurt and killed every year. Uh, number one on that list is Amazon, if that's a shocker. Mm -hmm. Six workers have died in the last seven months that have worked for Amazon. So it's not just construction sites, it's in facilities, warehouses, you name it. Um, Facebook was another one, uh, the lowest paid monitor Moderators spend hours each day watching hate speech, pornography, images of suicide, murders, and beheadings. That's basically what Facebook has their workers doing and the stuff that they're working on. It's crazy. Uh, one more good one that was on here was uh, McDonald's. More than two dozen workers have filed uh, equal opportunity. What was that? The EEOC complaints about sexual harassment. Workers strike to protest the company's failure to act and demand that McDonald's USA is accountable for working conditions in both their corporate and franchise stores. So some of the biggest employers in this country um, have the most workers hurt and the most workers killed no matter what, if it's a construction site or if it's a uh, warehouse or if it's a fast food restaurant. So now that I'm finished reading off that list, anybody that would like to come forward and speak about where workers have been hurt or killed, where they have seen or witnessed, or of any other stories along them lines, this is going to be a public comment for anybody that wants to come up and speak. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Frew. I'm from Local 785 Labors. And uh, actually, uh, I spoke to Rick earlier. He asked me to speak on an incident that we both uh, shared in common. Before, long before I got into construction, I worked for the Handicapped Children's Association with Rick. And uh, one day I'm talking to a coworker uh, over a breakfast counter taking care of some kids and we're having a conversation and all of a sudden I hear a thud which obviously to me sounded like her head didn't ground I jumped over she had fallen out I don't know if she had a seizure or whatever thankfully I was standing right there next to her Rick's upstairs in the house and I scream for Rick to come down as soon as he gets down the monitor I jump on and call 911 I take the kids and I go upstairs and I'm not part of the emergency response anymore Rick's taking care of it and uh, but come to find out, you know, 10 minutes later when the ambulance is taking her out, that she's in critical condition. Turns out she had a, a brain aneurysm, and if we hadn't, if I hadn't been talking to her, she would have died. If I had to come up on her a minute or two later, you know, she would have been dead. Uh, so, you know, critical fast response was, saved her life, you know, and again, it's not a construction industry. We worked with handicapped kids, you know what I mean? I was running around with, you know, special needs kids all day, so. I wanted to share. You know, it was kind of funny. I haven't seen Rick in a long time since then. So, of course, I see him here at this. So, thank you. Uh, 
John Patel, um, also 75. Um, this is actually a pretty good story. So I was working in a non-union non company and uh, removing asbestos from buildings. And uh, the place had had a fire, so it not only was fire damaged, but it was also water damaged. Um, and they put a, not a small guy, 250 pounds, on a water damaged and fire damaged roof. Um, despite say it didn't end up well. The only thing that saved me was when I went through the roof, my arms were out, so that's what caught me. <clears throat> that night I went home, and I called one guy in this room, and he helped me get into a union where injuries happen on the job, and I'm not saying they're, they're not going to, but uh, at least I know that if, if I get hurt with a union company, I know I'm going to be taken care of. So it's a good thing to keep in mind. <laughs> Hello, it's me again, Phil Shanahan. Um, I wasn't in this situation. It, um, I just wanted to talk about an injury that I seen on the job site that was pretty horrific. Um, I think everyone survived. Unfortunately, I don't know all the answers. There could have been death, but there's workers that will never work again. I was working over at SUNY Binghamton at um, dorm project there was three dorms coming up there was a hydraulic jack scaffolding there's some roofing roofers doing some shingling on the roof and pretty much the the hydraulic scaffolding that would bring them up to the roof while they were up on it it's they're up at the top and they have it full of materials well the middle section just went right under and it was right at lunch I was around the corner, thank God there was no one underneath it also, but we, you had, I think, five workers that fell off. Some went into the building, some landed all the way to the ground. Um, unfortunately, it's just, it's terrible to see a situation like that. I don't know if it could have been safe. I don't know if it was a problem with putting it up or if it was just a malfunction, but it was an um, injury, and obviously, you know, those people, if they survived, they went home hurting and uh, probably never working again. And uh, that is just one incident, and so just be thankful that, you know, every day you go to work because you never know what's going to happen. Harry Stanford, the man who wrote that very first song we sang tonight, We Just Come to Work Here, We Don't Come to Die. Where did that song come from? Harry passed away about seven, eight years ago, but he told me the story. He was a longshore America and uh, working out in uh, Coos Bay, actually, out there uh, unloading the, the you know, ships. This is around the 1980s, and it was after O Ship come into play, that's why that figures in the song. But he had a union, and one day, uh, and he had a union contract, of course. And the longshore work was pretty strong out there on the West Coast. They could shut the whole West Coast down if they want to, and they have, right? Um, well, one day they were they were loading they were unloading logs, you know, with chains, you know, big, you know, forty foot sections of trees out of a big container trip, and the chain had broken, and the boss ordered Harry to go down into the hole there to get the chain reattached. Harry looked one look and took one look at that and figured if he was going down there, there was a good chance he might not come out because all those logs were, you know, kind of skewed in the ship, and he was supposed to go down there and reattach it so that he could pull the chain up. So he said, I'm not going down there unless you're going down there with me. And the boss fired him on the spot. Now, because he had a union, they knew what to do next. They called the arbitrator. They stopped work on the ship. Nobody was gonna work on that ship until the arbitrator came. He says it took about two or three hours for the arbitrator to get there. Arbitrator, he said, we went to the bar, and while I sat there at the bar, I started writing this song, we just come to work here, we don't come to die. The arbitrator showed up, took one look at that ship, and said, well, you're not going down there. And that's the power of unity. He got his job back within three hours because of the unit. So I just wanted to share that one, because that's a, a story in which a worker didn't die because of the power of unity. Valerie worked. The, the, the night before until 11 o'clock at night, and she came in at 7, I think it was then, yeah. yeah. So she was extremely tired. And a lot of people that work, are, they work tired. They don't get enough sleep, they don't get enough time to sleep. And it's one of the causes of why people get injured. They fall asleep driving home, 
you know, you don't think of it as an industrial accident or work-related, but they fall asleep. The other one is that we, the, where the respite house where we worked on Front Street was right next door to the American Civic Association. And a number of us were there when it happened. You know, uh, we were about maybe 100, 100 feet or so away between, between the buildings. And there were two things. One is that Beverly Young, Jung, the guy that worked there, had worked in Endicott with toxic chemicals. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know this because um, our, we're friends with the uh, person that did the autopsy. And every time that, that anybody is exposed to this particular chemical, the FBI is brought in because uh, it's a neurotoxin and it causes all kinds of trouble. So first, you know, just I'm not I'm not sympathizing with him. I'm not I'm not trying to, you know, take away from what he did. But he got no counseling. He got no assistance because he worked in a place and he, he lost his job and a lot of trouble going on. The other part of it is that most of the people that died in the building they bled to death because the police waited outside and they didn't go in. And there were emergency trauma units, you know, at Wilson Lord's Hospital within minutes away. But be because the police had hesitated and it was the heroic action of the secretary who had been shot and was wounded and told the police that he had committed suicide a good 20, 30, 40 minutes before the police entered the building. And it's really a tragedy you know, and it's something that comes has come up a number of times with people in Broome County and Binghamton, is that whenever there's a Columbine, you know, and all these different shootings go on, Binghamton is never mentioned. And it's just something that this is routinely happens, and I, it's just something to remember and to talk about. A number of times that we had the, the uh, Workers' Memorial was held at the American Civic Association Monument on Front Street. You know, Pardon so, me, I'm the president of uh, Six District Substitute Teachers Union, Substitutes United and Broom, and uh, Roberta King, Bobby King, was um, our one of our Binghamton district representatives at that time, and uh, she subbed in both Binghamton and Shenango Valley, and. Outside of our union, she subbed at the American Civic Association. And uh, she was one of, as, as I assume many of you know, one of the people uh, who was uh, killed that day. And, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, when we normally think of, you know, workplace safety and so on, we think of industrial accidents. Uh, but now, of course, with, with all the horrendous uh, the shootings at schools all around the country and abroad and in other uh, places as well. Uh, being a teacher is, is also, and any kind of a school employee, is uh, a dangerous job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And just one other thing too, um, you know, we, we listen to a lot of terrific songs about our great labor people from the past, and one was Mother Jones, and she famously said, don't mourn, organize. And there's an incredible bunch, bunch of literature here that everybody's you know, free to take. Uh, look it up, study it. There's a petition for farm workers, New York State farm workers, um, because in New York, farm workers still don't have the same protections that other workers have, and this is something really important to sign. And I just, one other thing, little thing, um, and Mitch, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the American Legion, um, I was, you know, listening to the IWW, so I believe, and I, this is just a change in, like, the history of the organizations, but the American Legion spent a lot of time beating up and uh, torturing and tar and feathering uh, IWW and labor organizers in the past. There's a great movie and a book called Ironweed about the American Legion doing this up in Albany. Um, so, and if you read, I, I was just struck by the fact that you were singing in front of this preamble that oh, talks no. about Americanism. And, the irony um, is not lost on us. We're yeah. all members of the IW. Yeah. Yeah. But, I'm just, but I'm saying, like, but here's the truth. You know, last year we had Workers' Memorial Day in uh, George F. Johnson's mother's church. 
and there's a gymnasium that was built out of uh, shoe leather, and this was, uh, EJ, as we all know, was a union busting, <laughs> you know, anti-union company, uh, but now their, 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 po their palace of gold, you know, mm -hmm. ha has come to the point where workers are able to organize <laughs> and have events here, and the same is true of the American Legion, so. The times they are a change. So, uh, jackhammer and take out the concrete. We had to put shoring frames underneath it, so you shore it up so that way the ramp, the ramp doesn't collapse on top of itself. So as we were finishing up the ramp, we were stacking the shoring frames, and you want to stack them at roughly a 40, 45 degree angle, and band 20 of them at a time. That's roughly 2,000 pounds. Well, I was up one level, and I heard a guy scream, so I take off running. I've been first aid CPR and defibrillator certified since 2008. And the frames, the guy did not have a good enough angle, and as he turned around, they fell on him, and they bent him in half. Basically, his lips to his heels, bent him in half. I was the first one on the scene. I pulled him out from underneath the things. I braced his neck, I braced his back. Um, to this day, he can walk. I managed to also call up the 911 call. He'll never work again. Uh, he can't walk without a walker. He'll be 35 this year, his name is Pat. Um, I stay in touch with him, and it was one of the most horrific things I've ever seen in my entire life. And it's not something I've ever forgotten. And there's no OSHA standard for the way to stack shoring frames. They just say put it at a decent um, angle to make sure it doesn't topple over on top of you. And um, it's just something I was only in the trade for three years at the time it happened. And it's something to this day, anytime I see shoring frames being stacked, I always check that angle because you don't forget about it. I mean, you run up on a human being bent in a way he shouldn't be bent. You'll remember that the rest of your life. So workplace accidents happen. People get killed on the job every day and it's a crying shame. So I thank everybody again for coming out. Please make sure everybody eats. I don't want to eat hamburgers and hot dogs for the next 30 days. Well, I guess I should test off on myself. Many years ago, uh, before I knew Terry, I was a, a registered nurse. Uh, it wasn't before I knew Terry. It was actually right after Terry and I got together. I was a registered nurse working at the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C., member of the, the union, member of the ANA, and uh, I was uh, exposed on the job to hepatitis B, and I was uh, pretty much disabled for a period of about three months. Um, the good news is I, I did, in fact, have a complete recovery, uh, which doesn't always happen. And um, just to, I guess, make people aware that um, working in hospitals, particularly in the nursing profession, is one of the most dangerous jobs that there is. Um, not only are you on a daily basis exposed to pathogens, um, and those pathogens are getting weirder and weirder and more and more difficult to deal with, um, but nurses, are probably the most likely professionals to be physically attacked on the job. And uh, so it can be pretty dangerous. Work. We're going to move on and do some more songs here. And this one was written in 1931 by a, a woman whose husband was a coal miner in uh, Harlem County, Kentucky. Her name was Florence Reese. And this is probably, next to Solidarity Forever, the most famous yeah. union song there is. We're going to pretty much sing the original words. Uh, but I think we're going to change one thing at the end. Now I'm in C minor. That's this, so I always do the song in C minor because that's what you're supposed to do. C minor. Okay. Time this time, but we're gonna sing it once each time. So sing it with us. Bell. 
Salvation Army talking talk about four enemies, right? <laughs> yeah, the Allegiant wasn't too kind to, to the unions in the old days, a hundred years ago. Uh, the Salvation Army used to come out with their bands to drown out the organizers in the street, you know? Back in the old days, they didn't have PA systems a hundred years ago. They'd step up on the soapbox. That's where we get some of our slang from, right? You got up on the soapbox, so you could be heard above the crowd. And when the union, when the IWW was organizing, they often send the the, uh, the bosses would have the, uh, the Salvation Army band come out and try to drown them out. But the genius of the IWW is they learned to write parodies to those Christian hymns. So all of a sudden they had a backing band. And when the, when the uh, Sallies would come out with the band and try to drown them out, they'd go, time for a song, boys! And they'd start singing a parody to one of those Christian hymns, like the Sweet By and By. Like this one. Long-haired preachers come out every night Try to tell you what's wrong and what's right Then ask how about something to eat Your answering voice is so sweet You will eat, you will eat By and by, by and by In the glorious land of the sky Where am I? Work and pray, work and pray Bye. 
share some of these great songs and of course to remind you of course of the struggle that you were participating in as workers and as union activists and union members every day you know we're all members of the IWW we're all members of the American Federation of Musicians also local 1000 which is a union that people like Pete Seeger and Charlie King and John McCutcheon and these folks were around uh, when it started some 25 years ago we're traveling folk singers like us you know and people who work on the road uh, we take our work very seriously. These folks are busy 45 weeks a year typically doing schools and concerts and festivals and working with young people in disadvantaged areas. And then I do a lot of my work with nursing homes and veterans homes throughout the area. And I'm not touring. So uh, I want to sing you one song, another one by Woody Guthrie, one of his last great songs called Deportees. We're talking about farm workers and the focus on farm workers and the fight for fair wage, fair working conditions, right? I remember 15, 20 years ago when I was a young union organizer in New York City uh, fighting for bathroom breaks, right? Fighting for bathrooms, port sands in the, in the fields for these workers, fighting for access to cold drinking water when they're working in 90 degrees or hotter weather, right? Mm -hmm. Things that most of us don't have to contemplate. So Woody wrote this beautiful song in 1947, it was one of his last pieces when he heard about a plane load of deportees being sent back to Mexico. And many of them were, were legal workers. They had been there on work permits, and their work permits were done. And they were going back, and they'd come back the next season. A few of the folks on that plane were illegals. But the plane crashed, and there was a big story in the newspaper and a radio broadcast. They talked about the, the three pilots on the plane and named them. And then they said the rest were just a bunch of deportees and didn't give them names or list their names. And Woody was so shocked by that, so angry by that, he wrote this piece. And he gave them names. And the quote of that story is about five years ago, they, they did the research and they found the names of those, I think it was 28 people on that plane, with deportees. And John McCutcheon was involved in that, the great folk singer. Um, and they actually put up a monument to them on the graveyard with those 28 bodies out in Los Gatos, uh, California, where we like to be. One of Woody's great songs. And if you know the words, sing along. If not, when we get to the chorus, it's very easy. By the second chorus, you can join us. He gave them all names. The crops are all in, and the peaches are ripe. Oranges are piled in their green so dumps. Mexican board takes all your money way back again. My father's own father waited that river, took all the money 
fade in his life. Sisters and brothers come work in the food fields. They rolled that truck till they went down and died. Here's the chorus. Sing along if you know it. Goodbye to my one. Goodbye to Rosalita. Adios, mis amigos. Suse Maria. You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane.
like to thank uh, Rick, Tom, all these wonderful people in this room for all the things you do in your community. Because uh, I know it's 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 the labor world that's keeping us all going. Greg and I are from uh, Union Families back in Ohio. My father worked for Firestone Tire Rubber Company. Greg's family was in steel. So we grew up on that burning river, you know, the one that uh, has been sung so much about. So we really uh, understand what you all are talking about here today. And we really uh, hope that you enjoyed the music as much as we did the stories that you had to share with us today. So we want to thank George Mann for helping put this all together. We want to thank Mike for running all over the place to get these, these little batteries for us. And, and just all of you for taking the time out today on this cold, miserable, rainy day to come inside and sing some songs and, and I'll share the solidarity that we need. Um, so thank you very much. We're going to do another sign, kind of sign here. This uh, is based on the story of the, the funeral of Joe Hill in uh, 1915. Uh, boy, Chicago had never seen anything like that. Thousands of people in the streets for a funeral for one guy. Um, and uh, at that point in time. Of course, what happened with Joe Hill was, uh, he's the guy actually who said, made that comment in a letter to Bill Haywood said, don't waste any time mourning, organize. And he said to uh, he said to Bill, look, it's only 100 miles from Salt Lake to the Wyoming state line. Get me out of here because I don't want to be caught dead in Utah. So they did, they honored his request and they took him to Chicago where he was cremated and his ashes were divided up into 600 portions. And each one of those portions was put into a little envelope. And then it was those were mailed out to IWW offices all around the world with an instruction that said, these are the ashes, per his instructions, per his request, these are the ashes of Joe Hill. Fellow worker, do with them as you see fit, and when you've done so, send a letter back to William Haywood at the general headquarters in Chicago and tell you tell them what you what you did and when and what the circumstances were. So that's how Joe Hill came to not be buried, except all around the world and um, so that's kind of the gist to this uh, this song it alludes to a few famous things like the famous um, Earl Robinson and Alfred Hayes song that everybody knows I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night alive as you and me it also alludes to uh, some of Joe's more infamous characters Casey Jones the Union scab and Scissor Bill and Mr. Block and so but it also refers to the heart that they pinned on Joe when they executed the name of the song is paper heart. They had to have a target, so they pinned a paper heart on his chest. And then he was, of course, it was his choice to be executed by firing squad. And they had four marksmen and three bullets, no, five marksmen and three bullets. I'm sorry, five, five, five marksmen and, four, and bullets. four bullets. You can see it in the photograph because they did a photograph of him in death. And he's got four bullet holes in his chest. So any one of those is a standard practice. Any one of those marksmen could, in fact, claim that I don't know whether I shot him or not. They had the blank. It's because they had the blank. So, um, and they say that Joe Hill's last words were, fire. <laughs> Somebody else said, ready, aim, and he yelled out, fire. Anyway, so this is Sycon's story of Joe Hill's funeral. Oh, 
again for having us and uh, thank you again to the Bloom uh, Central Labor Council, Bloom County Central Labor Council for putting this together. Be safe on the job, speak up when you see abuses, and organize for a better world and a more human world, right? Labor's anthem, solidarity forever. And I hope you know the words to this, at least you know the choruses, right? And we'll start it out. Please feel free to join in. Stand up, raise your fist, join hands, whatever you feel like doing. But this is what we do in the union. Right from the union's inspiration, through the workers' blood shall run. There can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet one boss on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one. But the Greater than the heart of the 
well. Safe travels.